Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Figure It Out cast for June uh, 2022. I am your host, uh, Adam Corlick, and I'm joined by the evil Rob Thanos. Rob, welcome back. Hello there. <laughs> appropriate although we will not be talking about obi-wan in this i mean i I guess i'm guessing that's next month if i yeah probably yeah um uh and as always this is a patreon backed podcast so if you support this you get early access to it uh you can get a shout out you can pick a subject and you can even be on the podcast plus you can just you know support me which i appreciate you doing uh but we have one such person abdullah welcome back man hello happy happy to be back as always Thank you. Um, so, so let's just let's just get into it. Uh, so, Abdullah, as always, you get to pick a subject. Um, and while you did pick a subject, I changed it for you. So, thank you. Um, but <laughs> no, we, no, no worries. Actually, because mine was quite bad. So no, it wasn't bad. It was just kind of that. it was just kind of abstract. And I thought, you know what? Something kind of significant happened. So let's let's talk about that. Before we do that, though, I do want to point out there's going to be a few things that we are obviously not going to talk about. So um, this is June. This is normally when like an E3 type of thing would be happening. This year, it's not really happening. But a bunch of companies are making all their announcements. We've already seen a few like Resident Evil 4 remake, which by the way I'm excited for. Uh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, last we'll- Last of Us remake just got announced. Yeah. Day, yeah, that like, the, so. that's it, it's is that a remake or are they just like it's, re-releasing no, it well, in higher the, def? Yeah, I, I I I don't even know. I think it's the most unneeded re- like remaster ever, but j- just so they could charge another seventy dollars for it, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so w- what I'm basically saying is we're we're aware of these things, or at least the ones that have happened at the time we're recording, and we're not really talking about most of them. Speaking of re-releases, uh, the subject that. Um, that we did pick for you, Abdullah, and that you gave a big thumbs up on is something that just got announced a couple days ago as of this recording on June 9th, which is Sega's back in the hardware game again, right? Uh, yeah, that, with that's the, what that meant. That's what all those headlines, yep, that's exactly it. Sega making <laughs> consoles again. Sega back in the console making business, I baby. I hate clickbait. I hate I know. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, go on. So, uh, yes, yeah, so Sega of Japan announced, uh, I think it was during, like, a Sonic stream or something like that? No, um, they had a separate stream for just this thing. What was uh, weird about it is they did it at, like, I mean, for them it's not weird given the time zone, but for us they did it, like, four in the morning with almost no Western fanfare. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Talk. So Sega announced the uh, the upcoming release of their Mega Drive uh, 2 Mini. Or Mega Drive Mini 2, um, which is going to be their second mini console kind of manufactured in-house um, after the Genesis uh, Mini was released a couple years ago. Actually, that's and, the fourth. You forgot about the uh, arcade one and the Game Gear Minis. And of all right. people, and of all people, to forget about the Game Gear Minis. I know. I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> as, as you as you mentioned it, I forgot about the Astro City Mini too. Um, but yeah, they're they're yeah. So they're re- they are doing another Genesis based Mini. Um, this time uh, based around the Model Two, the slim version of the uh, of the Genesis. And uh, the the thing that's got honestly me exciting, and most of the people that I've heard react to this is that this is going to support Sega CD games. Yep. That's, that's, that's really what makes it interesting to be completely honest. I mean, they did a couple little niceties. It turns out like, so it's going to come with like a little Sega CD dock, which actually can physically connect to the medic, uh, the model one Genesis mini, just like if you want it connected, it will technically work. Um, just like the, uh, in Japan, they got that tower of power kit that was just complete plastic. It had no hardware or electronics in it, but it's kind of the same deal. Like that one doesn't actually have electronics in it, but it will physically fit together where what really it is. Of course, it's just like a little emulator box that Sega put together and the newer one will support Sega CD games. Um, and (laughs) it's, it's kind of an interesting thing that they did this, but, um, you know that's that was honestly the only real product value to it is because, as people have pointed out a million times over, the Genesis has been re-released like a million times. Yeah. Um. And so, I, 
while I obviously want to talk more about this thing specifically, and I, I want to get Abdullah's uh, opinions on all this, there is one thing I need to say and get this out of the way, because it comes up every time Sega does anything about, like, minis. Why is it always the Genesis, is the question. So I want to break down a little bit of Sega's hardware history and explain to you why it's always only ever going to be the Genesis. Uh, game gear and, uh, you know, cutesiness aside. Um, Sega's first console, like the SG-1000, they are never going to touch that again. Like, that was actually the, one of the original developers of it was like, that would be cool, and people ran with that like that was going to happen. They're never going to make that because even the Japanese don't know that Sega ever had that console. It's an obscure piece of hardware. Uh, the Master System, a.k.a. the Mark III in Japan, was a tremendous flop in Japan. It was an even more tremendous flop in North America. The Master System is still active in Brazil, believe it or not. Uh, and so the only place where a Master System Mini could be successful would be Europe, and I just don't think they would waste their time. Nothing against Europe, I just... Sega Japan is not the type of company that is going to allow such a unique release to only exist in one region that isn't Japan. So I don't even think they would really seriously consider the Master System, unless they just truly can't come up with a better idea, then maybe they would release that in, in Europe only, but I really don't see that happening. But from an emulation standpoint, that would be easy. Genesis, obviously, they've covered extensively. Sega CD is what makes this special. If you ask me, I think that 32X is very easy at this point to replicate. Like you, it's emulators. Genesis emulators typically can handle it, so it wouldn't surprise me if eventually they either announce that there's like 32X support in this thing, or you know, maybe they do a third one that looks like the Genesis 3 that <laughs> the has Genesis, that, <laughs> by Genesis 3 that doesn't actually support 32 <laughs> Yeah, the irony would be not lost on anybody. Well, the funny thing about that, of course, is that the Genesis, yeah, like you said, doesn't support it, but also that it would just, you know, uh, they didn't even make that. May, may, so, may, may, maybe they'll do the, uh, the Sega uh, Pluto Mini. Or the yeah, Sega Nep would, the Sega Neptune the, Mini, the where Neptune it's just that we never got. Yeah, <laughs> that would be cool. Um, no, I w I'm joking about that. Because the thing is, 32x is not going to bring all the nerds to the yard. You know what I mean? It never did. That was kind of the point. So it wouldn't surprise me if they announced later that the Mini Two supports 32x, uh, and they're just like waiting, sitting on that because the Sega CD is more interesting. But I'm, you know whatever who knows but my point is they're not gonna do like a standalone 32x it's not enough it's not interesting so then you get into the ones that everybody asks about uh which is the saturn and the dreamcast right um the problem you have with both of those is that saturn emulation in particular is extraordinarily complicated to this day it is not an easy thing to do um, and in order to get it down into, first of all, they would have to actually master it, which they have not. Uh, and the problem is the Saturn itself has no market viability outside of a few nerds such as ourselves, uh, and Japan in Japan, the Saturn mini could actually theoretically be successful from a marketing standpoint. Cause that country has nostalgia for that device, North America and Europe do not. And their votes essentially don't matter. Hence, you don't get the master system mini as mentioned before. Um, but so basically Saturn would be needlessly complicated to produce uh, and would not earn any money uh, in order for them to generate a profit on something like that. They would probably have to really make it expensive, which wouldn't work. Nobody would buy it. Um, but then you run into essentially the same issue with the Dreamcast, which is while it has more market viability than the Saturn does, emulating it is not an easy task. It is easier than the Saturn. But that's on, like, a PC. Getting that into some, you know, compact little form factor device that looks like a cutesy, chibi little Saturn or a cutesy, chibi little Dreamcast is not possible for the budget range that people would want to pay. You know, I've had that discussion with people. They're like, oh, my PC can emulate it, so why can't I just, why can't they just release, like, a $60 box that does it? Because we live in reality. That's why they can't do that. It would, you know, a Saturn or, you know, Dreamcast Mini that actually was form factored the way you'd like they would probably have to charge like retail like $300 for it maybe 200 and nobody would be happy with that um so the alternative in the dreamcast case anyway would be to make like a little form factor box that uses pc ports of it kind of like they did with that dreamcast collection for the 360 nobody would yeah. be happy with that either nobody really wins that's why you're probably never gonna see those it's not that sega is just like oh 
we didn't know you would want that it's it's they cannot do it and make money on it that's really all it is is there's it's not market viable it would cost too much to produce and it's very technically challenging saturn especially and it doesn't help them in saturn's case they lost most of that source code anyway so it's i mean you're technically yeah you could have it run the isos i guess but i just i don't i just don't believe that's ever gonna happen um anyway so that's i wanted to set that out there before we go why are they revisiting the genesis that's why they're revisiting the genesis it's the only one that's easy it's cheap people have nostalgia for it and it was a success originally and all you can really do to make that more attractive is sega cd you know yeah i mean the that's the interesting thing is that I don't think really the public at large has any nostalgia for the Sega CD, which is kind of why this is interesting to me that they're including Sega CD games. And the the games that they're choosing too are like for the most part pretty good choices so far. Um like Shining Force CD um and uh Sylphid, like you know the games that they're choosing are kind of interesting um granted like the, they could uh, the the genesis games that they've announced so far were not on uh the first genesis mini so there's been no overlap so far which is good um you know there are especially kind of late genesis releases that you know could um, could be good choices for it, stuff like um, Streets of Rage 3, or maybe the Splatterhouse uh, 2 and 3 would be kind of cool, because we already got a Splatterhouse 1 release on the Turbo Mini. Sonic um, 3, now that that's kind of resolved. Son- yeah, Sonic 3, uh, like, they were, they're already putting Sonic CD on there. So, like, there are some, like, some Genesis games that were not on the first iteration of this that could go pretty well on it. Um, but the Sega CD games are interesting for uh, to me, um, specifically because there are a number of what I would consider as a Sega CD collector myself to be kind of your holy grail games that haven't gotten many re-releases. Um, and if you wanted an original release of it to play on your Sega CD, um, are are uh vastly more expensive than most people would be willing to spend on it and uh they mentioned so far they mentioned popful mail as a yeah, that threw C- me through a loop i was a little yeah, surprised by that one <laughs> which is i was like wow that's kind of a deep cut a uh, very good game kind of a 2d um action rpg a la something like the the wonder boy games um or um the, that's a very good game. It's upwards of seven hundred dollars now if you want an original copy of it. But um, I mean, the two that I've heard people immediately point to as saying as really saying that they hope get a release on this are uh, Snatcher um, and Ko Flying Squadron. Uh, Ko Flying Squadron is a cute 'em up kind of shoot shooter game um, that was, I believe, published by JVC. And is probably the most expensive game on the system. Uh, very, very limited release. Um, I don't think it's is ever it? gotten any re-release on. How about any... Radical Rex or whatever. It's I don't. It's not as expensive as Ko. Ko is like upwards of three grand. I think now. Okay. What um, do I? I don't, you you know more about Sega CD Mario yeah, than I do. Yeah. Um, and Snatcher um, is uh, infamously. Uh, uh, produced by Hideo Kojima of Metal Gear Solid fame, and is a visual novel, a cyberpunk, uh, a la um, something like uh, uh, Blade Runner, and it was exclusive to the uh, the English translation is exclusive to the Sega CD. Um, the now when you're talking about Kojima and Konami. Um, the rights issues kind of come into conflict a little bit. That's, you know, the licensing and things like that. Um, which is like, but Konami ha- recently has been kind of willing to play ball a little bit more. Um, they're releasing the, the Ninja Turtles games. Uh, they're releasing the, uh, uh, the uh, Castlevania games and collections on modern consoles. Hell, they already re-released Snatcher 
on the TurboGrafx 16 Mini because Snatcher was on the PC Engine CD. But the difference is that that game is, uh, that version of the game is entirely in Japanese. So what people, myself included, are really hoping for is if this console does get released in the Americas, which, to be fair, has not been confirmed for yet, um, is that yeah, we, we should get... have said that the, most yeah. of this has been speculation. Yes. The only things we know is that, yes, it is coming. Yes, it will support some Sega CD games. It comes out in Japan in October, and I think it retails for like 60 bucks, which is surprisingly yeah. cheap. Um, but that's all we know. Everything else is just kind of whatever. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. So the speculation is if they do the rele- do end up releasing this in America, um, the possibility of having a Snatcher English release on there is really, really intriguing to a lot of people, myself included. Um, uh, Adam, I know you're a big Kojima guy. Did you ever play Snatcher, or do you own that no, game? Or? I don't own it, uh, which is why I haven't really played it. Um, now, granted, there's plenty of games I own that I've never played, but I, I really try not to pirate anything. Um, yeah. I would be willing, I think it would be fun next time I'm out at your place if we actually just like committed to sitting down and playing Snatcher. Like, It'd be fun. Hardware. Yeah. I think that would be cool. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's a different discussion. Um, yeah. So, our, Abdullah, you haven't said anything. Um, <laughs> yeah. And this I've was been, your uh, subject, man. You I wanted just... to talk all about this. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I've been thinking about it day and night, but... Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, well, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, you guys both talked about... Well, not you, Adam, you actually gave me information that I didn't know why they wouldn't make... Because I was going to make the point where, why don't they try to make another one? Uh, another oh, like console. like a Saturn? Because, yeah. Um, oh. Yeah, a Saturn Mini or a Dreamcast Mini, but I had no idea about the Saturn emulation and how tough it is quite surprising given the age of the console you'd think they figured it out but i mean that system was held together by duct tape and uh gumption so it's like the fact that like (laughs) you know that's why it's so difficult to emulate is just because it's Mm -hmm. it's not a traditional console it uses a lot of workarounds and um hacks in order to make 3d really work on the system yeah, so there, it, it's quite an odd console in Sega's history, despite Japan, that's like an exception. But since you guys covered generally what I was going to mention in terms of the games and these things, I might actually raise a question regarding this. Uh, in, in, in case they, they do release, like say this high dollar game like Snatcher or something, uh, what, would uh, would that do? Do you think that'll be that'll make it easier to get a copy of the game physically, for example, reduce the prices? I don't necessarily think that because there has been some examples, recent examples too, of high value games getting re released, and it really hasn't brought the the value down. In fact, in some cases, it actually held it pretty steady or increased because. Uh, it's gotten more visibility in the game. An example of that would be Shantae being re-released on the Switch and even on the Game Boy Color by Limited Run Games. And, uh, like, that game uh, infamously is a very uh, a very expensive Game Boy Color game, and they literally printed new copies of that game on Game Boy Color as well as releasing it on the PS4 and the Switch, but the, the value of that game has not dropped. The original... Uh, release of it so while rob is right he's he's there's a little more to it than that i will argue that i mean even though this isn't really the subject i will argue that when you do a re-release like that you do bring demand down in the sense that there's always going to be people who are like eh the re-release is good enough i don't need the original anymore the re-release costs 40 bucks the original costs three thousand or whatever the extreme is that said there's enough people out there who are like, hell no, I only want the original, that the price doesn't fluctuate much. Basically, it's still just as rare and still just ex- as expensive. It's just that you have a few less people going after it. It doesn't affect the market so it wouldn't enough. So it, it wouldn't be a significant uh, decrease, if any. 
I yeah, was, I seriously yeah. doubt that Snatcher would fall from its current price point to like half of what it is just because they would have put it on the Sega CD or Sega Genesis Mini 2. I do not see it affecting that. For the and same that reason was, that it, yeah. it never affected it when you could emulate it on an original modded Xbox 20 years ago. Like it's still, it's not that hard to emulate Sega CD and you could burn your own copy. Hell, the Sega CD reads burned games natively. You can burn yeah. your copy of Snatcher, and it never that, yeah. it never caused that issue. So it's nice to think that might happen for those of us who care. And to for some people, they'll be like, that is good enough. But those people are not the ones who would have been spending five grand anyway because they didn't. Because yeah, you you're definitely right. Because they've uh, there are other ways to do it. But if it was a console that you can't easily emulate and things like that, then maybe it would have an effect because, as you said, the point of uh, the Genesis itself, be, uh, the Sega CD being able to read burnt discs basically ends it all. Yeah. Anybody can do it. it Precisely. Need to be released. Now that said, uh, it, it's yeah. interesting you mentioned that because that said, it was kind of leads into the next point I would have had about this thing. Okay. I think that Which the is... most value that comes out of this is... This is going to be, like, the best home console way to play the Sega CD now. Uh, mm. if, if Sega is claiming that they've made, like, a perfect Sega CD emulator, which is not necessarily impossible. I mean, we've been doing that for a long time. You can run it through their own thing, and as soon as that little thing is hacked, and I guarantee it will be, the idea of being able to stuff it with, like, every Sega CD ISO, I mean, that's, that's going to be valuable to people. And instead can, of having to run can, it through can, other devices. Uh, can the Genesis Mini uh, run Sega CD games if you load the ISOs on there? You know, I don't know. Um, I've never hacked mine. Um, yeah. So mine, I, I don't either, know. Yeah. I, I know that somebody said that the, the Sega Genesis Mini is relatively... a lot. It's a lot more capable than a Genesis is. Mm -hmm. um, I think somebody was... Exper I, I swear somebody got it to run PS1 games at one point. Like, as just kind of a project. But that doesn't mean it was good at it. But it, it, the point is, I would assume, yes, it can be done. But I don't really know. Um, so I'm, I'm, that's pure speculation. But I guarantee you, if this thing has Sega CD support built into it, then yeah. Because most... I mean, again, we I don't know exactly how Sega designed the, the Genesis Minis. But if they did it any way like PC emulators do, they basically build a Genesis emulator. And then you just kind of throw a Sega CD BIOS in it. And that typically is about all it ever needed. Because let's not forget that the Sega CD itself basically just used the Genesis for most things. And it just kind of added a few extra features. And all those features could have been very easily digitally emulated. Um, and again, I'm no expert on that, but I, I wouldn't be, it would not be hard for me to believe that you could hack a Genesis Mini 1 to play Sega CD, but it also is easier to think that that will probably perform better on the Mini 2. Um, obviously the Sega CD is, um, is kind of the focus of our thing, but, um, the also potential for it possibly having 32X games, once again, this is speculation, um, because Sega in their press release, I think said, it's like, we're going to be announcing these games over the coming months and there's going to be like a surprise or something like that. I forget yeah, they the exact... did that with them. They did that with the first one. And the, so they were rolling out a couple of games and eventually one of the surprises was they put on that like unreleased Tetris, Tetris game. Yeah. yeah. And so they put the, uh, the, the uh, Darius, um, yeah, uh, yeah, fan yeah, games. Yeah. So, um, so who knows? They might say like at the last minute, it's like, hey, thirty-two X games aren't going to be on this too. And Sega uh, like developed most of the games for the thirty-two X, I believe. Um, so you know they have the rights to them. I think that would be so. If you're if you're adding Sega CD and thirty-two X games to this thing. Um, and it's hackable like the first one, even if, even if, you, uh, Snatcher is not on there, um, or Tempo or Knuckles Chaotix is, isn't on there and, but could be added afterwards. I mean, you're talking, as you mentioned about one of the possibly the best ways to play this on a home console. Yeah, although if they put 32x support in there and they don't put in Knuckles Chaotix, you just need to slap them in the face at that point. Yeah. Because, um, so at one point, you know, uh, somebody at Sega realized the anniversary of Knuckles Chaotix was coming up. It was right around the time they announced that Knuckles was going to be in Sonic 2, the movie. 
Um, so I remember them reaching out to me and they're like, can you take a photo of a co- your copy of Sonic and Knuckles so that we can <laughs> talk about it? Cause like they didn't even have one, but like, it's never had a re-release on anything ever yeah. officially. And it's like such an obvious, it's like, it's a Sonic game sort of, uh, that you've never revisited. And if you're going to go to the trouble of putting 32 X support on there, that seems like the most obvious thing to do. But again, speculation for all we know, they'll be like, you know, they won't put 32X support in there, and they'll wait until they re-release the Genesis 3 and as a joke, and then put it on there. <clears throat> Again, you know, but yeah. hopefully they have it because that would be a more interesting package. Yeah. But I would think at that point you're done re-releasing Genesis minis because I like, what else do you even do? Like all the the other hardware they did, it just there would be no point. I think my interest in this uh, is entirely dependent on a North American release. Um, because the games that I would really be interested in it are on the CD, and there are, are, you know, the games would also require some, you know, English translation to them. So that's pretty much the the reason I would get, but even if not, because for example, like the Game Gear, uh, I don't know if the, I don't think there was, it was just released in Japan, right? It was just just in Japan. Japan. Yeah, it's in Japan, yeah, so... Uh, that I never got up until the point. I never got interested in it. There's other things that I can get that are potentially going to be better to play on or even have right here. And it's it's a flop, so... Yeah, I mean, makes I, sense in- I got the Game Gear Micro just because I'm a massive Game Gear fan and I collect for the system. That's the only reason I got it. In, in the same way that, Adam, if there was a Dreamcast Mini... Um, ever released, you would probably get it just because, oh, you're, it's like a Dreamcast thing and it's cute and it's like it'll sit yeah. on my shelf, you know, even though you have a better way of playing all of those games, yeah. Yes, precisely, and I'm actually with you on that. If if this thing only gets released in Japan, then my extent to which I care would be either A, if Sega sent me one, which would be nice, but I wouldn't expect that, or B, if I was in Japan at like a hard off or something and they had one, and it was cheap, and I was like, well, that'll make a good little display piece. That would be the extent of it. If it's released in the U.S., I would probably get one just to support the idea of Sega making that, but I, much like you, Rob, I don't think I would really use it actively as my way of playing either the Genesis or the Sega CD. I would, again, make it a display piece, but I would be more motivated to get it early as opposed to if I casually find one in Japan for not much money. Um, okay, I think we've 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 done this to death. So let's let's move on. Thank you, Abdullah, for that. Um, the next the next subject, uh, which is actually kind of interesting because it's in a similar vein here, it comes from a, another backer who picked it. It's from a Spencer per year, uh, and he wanted us to talk about the Evercade. Now, Rob, what do you what do you know about the Evercade? So the Evercade is a a system. Um, both handheld, there's a handheld version and there's a home console version, which has been kind of a really interesting um, case study uh, for a uh, a hardware producer to release a new console and to get fairly consistent game releases on there, both of classic games, um, namely... Uh, you know, games that were on, like, the the Atari and even stuff like the Lynx um, and Genesis, things like that. Um, some Data East stuff is on there. Um, NES stuff is on there. It's, it's a pretty interesting thing. So it's like a retro-focused handheld and home console. There's two versions, as I mentioned. Uh, the interesting thing is that the Evercade release... Uh, Games are on cartridges. Uh, the cartridges are physical media with uh, n- no emulation whatsoever, um, and they are. Um, that part's not true. That part. Oh, I know. I know. You know what? I'm. I'm. I'm, not, I'm thinking of a different system. Yeah. No. So there is emulation, but the cartridges are pretty much uh, compilations of different things. So they'll get like a compilation of Atari 2600 games or Atari 7800 games um, or Lynx games, um, games from certain developers like Data East or Interplay. And then 
In addition, the cool thing is it has also been uh, an opportunity for independent game developers nowadays to to release their games, um, indie games, on physical cartridges uh, for a system. So uh, I do not have one of these. I have, Truth be told, I haven't even really played one, but I know it's got a pretty significant niche collector's group of, of people that, um, like I know people like uh, um, Pat the NES Punk and Metal Jesus have both um, you know said that they like the this console and its releases. Um, yeah, it's it's a pretty cool system, and I think the uh, presumably the the news that we're covering today is that they anou- they were now announcing another, I guess, revision of of the console that is going to be released. Yeah. So so here's the thing with the Evercade. I've it's such a I don't know where I stand. And so like, basically on the one hand, I love the idea and that this is going to sound bad, but I mean this positively, it's kind of the unfulfilled original promise of the Coleco chameleon. Um, you, you remember when they were talking about that, how it was going to be a retro console for the retro gamers and every game is going to have its own physical indie releases and blah, blah, blah. Like they essentially actually did do that. They just did it in a handheld version. I love that it gets, uh, annual release or not annual. That means every year just, it gets like releases like regularly. Um, and it's official, like, you know, all the companies that own those games have signed on, they allow these collections to exist, etc. Physical media, everything about it seems pretty cool to me. Um, on the other hand, the reason I don't have one, um, is that Songbird Productions, who, they're the guys who, like, did the re-release of a Nuon game, if you remember that, um, they actually reached out to me and they're like, hey, you know, do you want one of these you know would you do a video and i was kind of like i don't think so because i started getting neo geo uh, x you know flashbacks if you yeah. remember that thing it was the same basic idea it was we're gonna make a little portable emulator box that kind of in that case very specifically catered to the neo geo concept it was like hey It'll come with a bunch of games built in, but we'll give we'll have these like card releases. Uh, in that case, it was closer to an SD card of new games and updates and all stuff. And it was a pile of crap. Like even SNK like sued them over it. I remember making a video at the time saying that that was the one console I ever regretted owning, and that I owned a Tiger R Zone. Uh, and so I was like, and not that I thought the Evercade was bad, but just that it it didn't do anything for me. It reminded me too much of the Neo Geo X, and at the same time as I sit there and I look at it, I'm like, I'm sure it's, it's much more competently emulated, but at the end of the day, that is what it is. It is a collection of emulated games. And for me, I own a lot of those games physically because despite its name, they actually rarely use the arcade versions of anything. They typically use uh, like SNES and Genesis versions of games. And I either have those or have other ways to play them much like we were talking about with the Genesis mini. Um, and so to me, it screams like what it is. It's a passion project from some guys that did a, a decent enough job with, with what they have access to. And from a publication standpoint, the interesting thing about this, and it's the same with the Genesis Mini, is that all of a sudden, all these companies that owned rights to all these games finally understood that there was value in those titles. They didn't just have to rot. And so a lot of these these re-releases you're getting from, like you said, Data East and um, so on, they're companies that are not super active. They're just owned by some other corporation and realized, hey, you're going to pay us money to just say, yeah, go ahead, use game data that we made 30 years ago? Sure. That's a deal. And that's how a lot of this stuff is coming out now. It's the same with like Konami is that they're just like, we don't have to do anything and we make money. Sounds great. Like that is the function of a corporation. Um, It's just that I think Nintendo opened that door with the NES Classic when everyone realized you could make money off of stuff that you hadn't done any work on. Uh, And that to me is kind of the Evercade issue. Like it's, it's all legitimate, but to me, it just feels like I would be more excited about this thing if I did not own other video game devices, but liked video games. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at, too. I, that's why I don't own one, 
is that I do have other ways of playing these games. But um, to the to, uh, like to the point that you brought up, like I think it's been like a uh, uh, interesting way that certain developers have been able to re-release games, um, get them to do new markets. Um, I think the the indie support for like the modern games is really cool. Like for instance, they put Xeno Crisis on on the. Uh, on the Evercade, which is interesting because it's literally on everything. It's on Neo Geo. It's on the you know Dreamcast. It's on everything. Um, I'm an NPC in that game. <laughs> yeah, so it's like you know I, I like that. It's like hey, it's on Evercade too. It's like there is there. Um, you know they did the Toa Plan, um, uh, shoot 'em up uh, collection. You know like Snatcher and Tiger Heli and things like that. Um, are and uh, Zero Wing are on there. So it's you know I, I like that you know. It definitely has a niche. It's not necessarily me, but it, it it is for certain people, and I like the fact that it has a dedication to physical media and independent uh, game developers. So I you know I I like what it's doing, but it's not for me. That's exactly how I feel. That's exactly how I feel. Like I love it in concept, not interested. Do you know what I mean? That's that's where I'm at. But at least it's real. It materialized, not like the Coleco Chameleon. And now, I guess, since some we didn't even mention it, yeah, the recent complete outing of the uh, Intellivision Amico. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, by the way, the the TLDR right there. If you backed that thing, your money's gone, most likely. Yep. And you're not you're not getting anything. Sorry. It um, went into Tommy Tallarico's gas tank for his Ferrari. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, whatever. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, at least at least this exists. It's it's completely genuine about what it is. Aside from, I will say that I'm not a huge fan of the fact that they call it something like the Evercade and then rarely use arcade versions. At least there are there there are it, certain I, releases. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that. I understand that, and I know that they're working on. This is not an attempt to con anybody. I I, I agree with that. Um, and I guess that that mostly boiled down to screen dimension issues uh, because arcades typically were like an odd dimension that you didn't do on a portable. So you would have to basically redesign it. And maybe that's what the new one is. To be honest, I don't really know. Um, but and that's and we're, that's at best a minor complaint. Uh, I like the idea of this in so many ways. I also like that there's so many games that never got finished or you know get translated and brought over or for from you know odd markets in some random country and they brought it over for one other reason. I, I think that it does good. It I it just does not personally interest me to actually get one yeah to 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 your point about the arcade and the screen dimensions being an issue it, uh, one thing i i did a little research on the the new version of the uh, the evercade the exp that's coming out and uh the new version actually supports tate mode which is the the vertical oh yeah it's uh, um, tate tate oh uh, yeah uh i gotten some shit for that once in a video <laughs> um i was just thinking of the uh what was that uh, that other YouTube channel? Like that was his tape mode. I can't remember. Um, it's Tate. I uh, trust me. It's yeah. Tate. So so yeah. They the it's uh, supports Tate mode. So you're able to turn the system on the side, kind of like the Atari Lynx, ironically, and and be able to play vertical shooters like Truxton or something like that on there. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Like you know, said, you might get more. Yeah. Like I said, I think it does good. It just doesn't uh, appeal to me all that much. But Abdullah, obviously, since you're so silent, you must love this thing to no end. Oh, the Evercade? Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, I uh, I really, really don't like it. Really? Do, do you have one, or I'm, have you played it before? Or? No, no, never. I never thought of buying one. It's such a, pers it's a personal opinion. Uh, I not really interested at all in it i'm not really fun. i i just realized that they're starting that they're getting a new one that there's a new one that's coming up uh i understand that other people might enjoy it but personally i'm not i'm not attached to or interested in any of those games in general mm. and i'm willing to put my money in other things that i do enjoy it's just so a matter of personal opinion and enjoyment well, that, that's of course that's fine, but I'm picking your brain a little bit here. So, does it boil down to the hardware doesn't interest you, or it's like literally the game software just doesn't interest you? Uh, both, but mostly about the games. Uh, because you know, you, uh, the thing is, uh, you wouldn't realize that this is 
like an established one, uh, something that's been reviewed and uh, kind of well known uh, compared to the so many handhelds we get, like let's just say quote unquote dollar store handhelds. You would get confused with all of these things <laughs> mushed up together, so that's why I stepped away from yeah. from uh, from this. And as a as from from my perspective, I am not really interested. I I believe it has some maybe there's some Atari 2600 or games on there. Yeah, it has. Various I'm not mis- ones, yeah. yeah, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. and uh, 5200 and such. Uh, I'm not that attached to those because obviously it was way before uh, there I started playing games and uh, way way before that not even there were not even compilations that I played that would give me some sort of relation to that so uh, that's why I stepped out from this I'm not really interested at all in it and uh, such uh, consoles that emulate uh, or uh, I don't know. I'm not really sure of the mechanics of how I would place these, but uh, it seems to me like an idea that any emulator can do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Given the games that that are on there, like I, I if for example, it has like huge heavy hitter games, like at least the ones I'm interested in, then maybe I would. But I, I uh, when I saw what it, what was on there, I wasn't personally interested. Since Hence, I'm not really following up with the console. Me, but that's just throw, my personal opinion. Let me throw this out to everybody, and I, I don't. I'm not going there with this. It's just it's a genuine question. I would argue, to some extent, that the only thing that really distinguishes the Evercade from, say, the Genesis Mini Two, is the name brand, right? So, is that the only reason we would have more interest in the first one as opposed to the second one? I don't necessarily I can say, think that. I, I think it's it's similar target audiences, but they're going about it different ways. Um, they I think the Evercade is appealing entirely to retro game enthusiasts like us because the whole point about Evercade is that it supports physical media. Um, while the Genesis, I think, obviously it has us in mind, especially adding things like, say, CD, as we talked about, but also, I think they're also targeting, uh, your mom and pops at, uh, at Best Buy or Target walking around and looking for, you know, a, uh, you know, a cheap Christmas present. Um, you know, I think there, there is going to be crossover appeal, but I think their target audiences are a little bit different. Uh, okay. Can I jump in on that? There's one point that you mentioned. Yes, yeah, I think so. Uh, yes, it does appeal to the physical aspect of uh, that it has like cartridges with compilations or like, multiple games on them. But uh, what I would say, like counterpoint to that, is is yes, it does have these games. But the at least when I think about it, the reason physical games have value are two things. You know, of course, other the, are, of course, first of all, is playing the game. And to the historical significance of these games, uh, of what these games hold, like I could make a reproduction copy of, of say like I don't know, Pokemon Sapphire or something, and it wouldn't be uh, historically significant as the actual copy. So yes, it, it's good in terms of that is physical, so it's something you can collect. But I don't view that as, at least from my perspective, that that is actually something that's. Uh, valuable well unless it's many years down the road and people will say well we missed that we missed out on this thing and okay that, that's it but otherwise i don't see okay uh, any, I, any I, 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 no I, it makes sense so it is interesting and I, you know it would be an entire other discussion that would take us quite some time to really break down like why we feel that way versus one versus the other but we just have to move on, unfortunately, because it's we've been at this for a while. So, um, Abdullah, thank you very much for joining us, uh, as always. No problem. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Um, now, I'm going to do a round of shout-outs here. So the following people are all Patreon backers, and they're at the tier in which they get a shout-out. If you would like to upgrade to this or be part of this at any time, just feel free to go down to Patreon in the description there on YouTube. Uh, so we've got Luis Bonilla, Loke, Michael Kelly... Paul Lewis, Tim Inman, and Trey Wagner. Once again, that's Luis Bonilla, Loke, Michael Kelly, Paul Lewis, Tim Inman, and Trey Wagner. Thank you so much for your support. 
you're the real winners. And we're back. We've got uh, Joseph Tamburino has rejoined us. Welcome back, my friend. How you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing pretty good, Adam. I'm glad to be here again. Good. And uh, R- Rob's not here for this section, everybody, just so you know. So this is exclusively a party between the cool kids. Uh, it'll just be <laughs> Joe and I. We're going to have fun. It's going to be so much better without Rob. Um, but getting into it, uh, you decided, as always, you get to pick a subject. And the one you... Uh, it's interesting you picked this subject because I was actually thinking about this not too long ago, which I'll get into. But um, basically, if I understood your subject correctly, you want you brought up the idea that does a game being too big ever stop you from enjoying it, even if it's a game you wanted to play? Is that correct? I mean, not necessarily enjoying it entirely, but not enjoying it as much as you should be enjoying. It. You feel like you should be enjoying it, or just not enjoying it as much as you. You were, like, in the beginning, you're like, oh, I have, like, another, like, year left of playing this game before I'm done, or something exaggerated like that that's not actually, like, true, but it still feels that way. Yeah, I I completely understand what you're saying. Like, I I was actually going through this recently because my girlfriend and I I have been playing uh, Far Cry 6, right? And so, like with any Far Cry game, it's like, you enjoy the stories, but you also enjoy the side missions, but then there's, like so many side missions where you're just like i don't want to do the racing segments and i don't want to go around trying to find all the buried treasure and all that sort of stuff that really has no point but then you can't help but want to be you know a completionist and do them and then it's like it stops being fun and starts being a chore um so i I, that's it's yeah that i i completely feel you on that one right like, in my case, the game that actually made me start thinking about this was... Uh, I know the comment section's probably going to throw a fit, but I'm, it, Elden Ring. Honestly, I've been, okay. playing, I've been playing that. I got that when it came out. I've been playing it, and it's like, oh, God, there's so much game here. Like, I actually ended up taking a month-long break after I, like, hit 30 hours and then went back to it, played, like, another 30 hours, and I'm, like, 70-something hours into the game now. I'm still not done. I still have, like, two entire sections of the map that are just, like, completely unknown. And there's just so much to do in the game. It's like, where where do I go from here? It's like, I, I want to do everything, but everything is a lot. And in Elden Ring's case specifically, the game kind of knows that, because I'm not sure how aware you are of it, but... A lot of the stuff that in any other open world game that had that set up would be required for you to do, uh, the game is just like, yeah, nope, you, 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 go, you don't need to do that, just go here if you want. Huh. But, which, I mean, I guess would help if, you know, I would actually, you know, not do, try to do everything, but I'm like, it's like, but it, it it's a Souls game, there's lots of interesting stuff here, I want to go uncover everything. And it's just like, and then it gets to the point where I'm like, I don't want to, and then I stop playing for a while. Yeah, there's a word for that. It's called addiction, and you need to seek help. No, I'm with you, actually, (laughs) in all seriousness. Um, But yeah, no, I mean, I I completely get what you're saying, because it it is an interesting kind of consequence of what modern games have become, is that everyone wants to get the best value for their purchase, which is logical. That's human nature. Uh, and so the idea that, you know, you have these games that are open world and have so much to do and just makes you feel like your purchase is more justified, but that gets to a point from the creator's perspective where they have to kind of fill it with a lot of fluff and that's okay. You know, some of us really enjoy, shall we call it the tedium of a lot of that fluff, but at the same time, I'm like you too, where you're just like, am I wasting my time? I, I feel like I'm not even enjoying this because of this element of it, even though I like this game, and I just don't know why I'm doing this other than the sake of I just feel compelled to beat it. And that's like an interesting little... I don't know. It's a consequence, really, of all those things coming together. Yeah. Now, I'm not certain... I don't think that this is necessarily something that's like exclusive to open world games or anything like that but yeah I definitely but they see would why definitely be the most game. guilty of it yeah i would think they were the most guilty just because the whole idea is not to be linear um right. for example so uh, 
I would not call something like a Resident Evil game an open world because it kind of comes off like it at first because you feel like the map is so big and you can go anywhere, but you really can't. I mean, they're no. essentially just, it's it's all very much like a pathway, even though it looks like a giant city or whatever that you have access to. And there isn't a whole lot of deviation other than occasionally like, oh, there might be a health pack or something. Do you appreciate that model more than you do something like a true open world game? I wouldn't necessarily say it, I appreciate it more, but I do not run into this problem with like something like a Resident Evil game. I mean, what I mean, we've already talked about like my feelings on the RE2 remake, so you know I've run into some other problems with yes. some of them. But the game, but the Resident Evil games being too long or having too much good content in them has never been a problem for me so same and that that's my point yeah you know like that that's why i'm saying that i think open world games are the most guilty of that now every game has some measure of padding to an extent nothing's you know perfectly cut but yeah i i i I watched a video on this years ago um and i'm sorry because i'm going to be talking about shenmue here for a second because it was the first open world game um but Basically, you know, when when that game came out, one of the ideas they had was not to make the open world, they invented open world, but the idea wasn't open world in the sense of, like, the map will be the big element, it was more about the minutia and the detail, hence you can do things that are totally irrelevant, like, you can, you know, pick up oranges and look at them, which has no purpose in the gameplay, you just can, um, but the difference is within the psychology of the gameplay, you can do any of that stuff, but none of it achieves anything. You're never encouraged to do that. As in, there's no collectible element to it. There's no uh, financial monetary gain within the e- economy of the game to do it. So it's just kind of like if the player is curious. Hence, it encourages exploration and curiosity. But the map itself is very easy to memorize and kind of check everything out. Um, but eventually, I mean, Shenmue itself was not the biggest financial, uh, success. Therefore, eventually they kind of like, we like the idea of walking around, but we want to fix it in the way they saw that, which was more the GTA three model, which was make the map as ridiculously big as possible and just overload it with stuff, regardless of like, if any of it is really different or varied or, you know, whatever, And that can get a little repetitive, and I'm not saying GTA 3 is bad, I love that game just like everybody else did, but I think that that's really where the birth of all that kind of comes from, and now with modern technology you get to, as you point out, the point of Elden Ring, which is they are able to make these maps that are like geographically like the size of countries, Yeah. and you're you're told like you can go anywhere in it, it's like that's amazing, but like what like how much time does that take to traverse and the the idea that they implanted so much into it like my girlfriend and i were finishing up um assassin's creed uh odyssey uh because last time she was here the dlcs weren't out now they were so she wanted to play those and we were kind of she was kind of relearning the game again continuing where she had left off on it like a few years ago and we're like looking at this map of greece that they had built and it was like it's huge like you can go anywhere and it's like the actual like size of greece or at least that's how it comes off if you were to actually try to traverse it on foot so thank god for fast travel as a concept but but yeah i'm i'm totally with you where it's it's like on the one hand it's super amazing and impressive that we live in an era where you can do that but at the same time that can be really daunting where you just kind of like start off in a game and you're like (sighs) oh I'm going to have to go through all of this, aren't I? It doesn't feel as much fun as it does, like, a project. Yeah. Is that... And But I would say that that... I mean, I know I'm, ch- I'm talking a lot here, but basically to finish this point, it feels like that really boils down to your personality. If you're the type of person who's just like, yeah, yeah, whatever, I'm just doing the highlights of, like, the main story so I can just tell what went on, that's a different personality. I wish I had that because I can't. I need to be the guy who explores everything. And even in Resident Evil, for example, like I will explore every room before continuing anything, even when I know it's the wrong direction, because I'm like, oh, what if there's a health pack or something in there? But right. when you, where I get in trouble is exactly like what you're talking about with these like massive games where you can go anywhere and there's no actual structure really. Um, that and I also like the idea of kind of you know overpowering my character before he does the main story or she does the main story. Ah. <laughs> but that's that's a separate matter. Anyway, yeah. sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, like in the, in the case of Elden Ring specifically, which yeah, I'm bringing up again because it's the one I've played most recently. Like with that game, like yeah, like there's not. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that points you into like every different direction. Eventually, once you do like enough of it, the game will be like, yeah, okay, you you need to go here now. It doesn't actually matter which uh, parts of it you actually did beforehand. Like, like at least for I think like the first. 40 hours of the game or so, like, they're, you're almost certainly never going to actually be doing something that's required, like, that one thing is specifically required that you will have to do on every playthrough. Like, you have, mm-hmm. like, a ton of freedom there. And while there is, like, stuff that points you to certain directions, like, after, like, playing it for, like, 40 hours, and it's just like, I need to do something else. And then eventually I get, like I said, I came back to it, it's like, oh, cool. Yeah, I, re- I remember, like, why I like this game. But now I'm I'm hitting I'm approaching the point where I'm like I need to take a break again. No, I don't want to take another month long break because I'm actually like I'm pretty far. I mean I still have like the two areas and whatever. But if I wanted to and I could make myself do it, I could probably be lined to the end of the game at this point now. But, but, I mean for an open world game, we can't say. I, I guess we can say make less game, but um, <laughs> that's not like. And in the case of, like, From Software, they didn't make a necessary... They, like, specifically wouldn't make the big, massive open-world game just to make a big, massive open-world game because open-world games are popular. They did this for a reason. Like, an actual yeah. like, artistic reason this time. Because um, th- their main thing has been, like, the well-crafted, like, been like Dark Souls and, like, Bloodborne and Demon Souls for a while, which... Have been long and have had a lot of stuff, but have been like relative, have been like condensed and not open world. So they di- they didn't do this just because oh, open world is popular and it makes money because they make plenty of money on the other stuff. Though Elden Ring did make them the most money. So, well, yeah, Elden, <laughs> I mean, I haven't played Elden Ring, but even I know like that was a huge hit game, and that's yeah. there's a difference between quality open world and just like hey, it technically we're an open world game. Um, that's what everybody's mad at Sega about right now with that Sonic game. Everybody's saying that it just looks kind of directionless and it just has, like, no point. Um, and maybe yeah. we'll see when it gets that way. Have you seen the trailer for that? I saw the first one. Um, I haven't yeah. really well, the, been keeping a lot of track the, the on that. T- yeah, I don't, I don't blame you. The, the TLDR, if you will, is that uh, the new Sonic game that's coming up is Sonic's first open world game, but it kind of looks like nothing really happens in it. Um, which is not a good thing for an open world game, but that we we can't judge it until we've played it. But I guess what I'm saying is, I'm assuming, even though I just said I wouldn't judge it, I'm assuming it's probably going to be in that camp of the not great Sonic games, and that that'll be like one extreme, and something like Elden Ring will probably be down on the other end of like this is how you do open world. Um, but you know, because that's only because it's a recent game, and I can't think of any other massive failures of uh, open world off the top of my head at the moment. Um, where everybody remembers it anyway. Yeah, but, that, that, that's the thing. Like, it, there's so many open world games that, unless if they're like really good or really really bad in series that are usually considered pretty good, you're not going to yeah. remember what they are. Yeah, legendary failures is a rare thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, that, yeah. So um, I, I don't really know how to approach trying to fix that, other than say you kind of have to get over yourself. In that you have to stop caring. You have to try and play different games, uh, ones that don't do that type of model, or you kind of wait it out. Because the other thing is, and this I'm just speculating, that uh, it's possible that open world games, like every genre, will eventually cease to be profitable, um, and then they'll become somewhat more niche. Like, You know, in the 90s, it was platformers, and then the aughts, it was kind of like your first-person shooters. Not that those games don't still get made, but I would say they're no longer the, like, this is what every company is trying to to make happen now. Um, And then, you know, so open-world games are kind of, I don't know if I would say they're on their way out, because they're not, but I think they're kind of at the tail end of their mega lifespan, if you will. I I could definitely believe that. I mean... And honestly, this came up now because, I mean, I don't usually play many open world games. So, like, the last, I mean, I've played some of them. Like, I played the Infamous games, I played the Spider Man games, and I didn't have this problem with those, but those games also didn't 
the, those games also didn't have me feel like I was only a fourth of the way in in 50 hours. So yeah, and and that's and again, we're, I'm sure there's going to be people be people listening to this thinking like are you guys complaining that you got so much content for less money hell no we're simply saying that that can be kind of overwhelming to the point where it might actually perturb your interest from actually playing the game because it doesn't sound like fun anymore now it's like a job it's like responsibility oh yeah and and that's really the core issue is games should never, unless you actually work in the games industry or cover games for a job in any other fashion, such as YouTube or whatever, unless you do those things, games should not feel like a project. They should feel like entertainment. They should feel like escapism. That is when a game is at its best. So the simple question before us is, how does one make an open world game not feel like that? And the, the, what I'm trying to express through all of this is I don't really have an answer because I don't develop games. I, you know, I, I guess I, if I'm going to throw out like a half baked idea, it would be if something like I haven't played Elden Ring. So correct. You can laugh at how stupid the suggestion might be, but if it, Elden Ring, let's just say it's like, I don't know Elden Ring. Is there like a thing where like there's a submission of like, you can go around and collect all these treasures or something? No, at least, okay. or if there has been, I have not found it. You can find right, well, then I'm, a certain, you can find like an item in, use it at right, first, then, quest, but not like the, you're not finding like go find 10 rucksacks or whatever sure so let me let me rephrase that i'll use far cry 6 as an example because i know the game far better and you can put this into uh elden ring terms if you like so in far cry 6 and like most far cry games there is all sorts of side missions that really are just filler. And one of them would be like, there's always like, oh, there's a hundred treasure chests throughout the map somewhere. Just go find them. Uh, or, oh, there's, you have to collect like the, these 15 different types of fish somewhere. You know, what would be great is if in the options menu, you basically said like, I'm here for the story. Or I'm here for like the, you know, taking down the forts type of missions. I'm not here for the, minutia stuff i'm not here for the treasure and basically it just disables those things in a sense that they, they never come up in your inventory they never come up as a mission uh and you just kind of can get through the game in a more expediated pace but not because you chose to skip them in within the universe and just ignore them your variant of the gameplay just becomes one that doesn't have those things does that sound like a solution um for, Are you for following me? Yeah, I, I'm following you. And I guess for like games like Spider-Man or like Far Cry, I could see that working if they had this problem. That wouldn't work for Elden Ring because there's like no actual like mission log or whatever. You just stump. If you, if you're like doing like a side dungeon or whatever, it's because you stumbled upon it and found it. And mm -hmm. like I said, the game's like story itself. Like after you like kill a certain number of like the major the major storyline bosses. Flat out just tells you, okay, go here, even if you even if you still technically have like five of have like three of them left in the other parts of the world. It's like, yeah, at this point you you're you're, you're good. You can go here and you can go. Basically, like your your mission is to do, your mission this entire time has been to do this. Go here and go do that. So okay. like the game well, flat out half of the time doesn't necessarily expect you to be doing everything. So it okay. kind of seems like Elden Ring is actually trying to combat this problem and just because gamer and open world game, where a lot of us are just not doing that. So basically you're saying they tried to combat that problem by re removing all that stuff and then still made the game four times bigger. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> so I, I can't speak to that game with any knowledge because I haven't played it, but I'm... I'm just wondering if in theory there would be something like that where they could cut it out. But again, I it's pure speculation on uh as far as options go but i guess we'd be more interested from you guys name some games where you guys ran into this problem if you've ever run into this problem at all because i it seems unlikely to me that there's people who just can't relate to this but uh, you know i think the last time i would have thought that there were games where this wasn't an issue you'd have to go back a few generations to like uh just the more direct style of gameplay was being more common really pre open world honestly you know your 2d platformers there was never a, like oh you have to go down this side cave and find the treasure which is completely irrelevant to the rest of the story 
Um, like, you know what I was playing very recently uh, for the first time in, like, 20 years? I, I beat Silent Hill 2 again. Ooh. And Yeah, and I'm sitting there, as I'm playing it, I'm thinking, this, this is a game with almost no fat on it. You know, like, it's it, it gives the illusion of an open world type of game because of the nature of the fact you can walk around with the character and you have this big map and it looks, there's all these buildings, nothing's obstructing you, you feel like you can go anywhere. But that's not the reality of it. Like, you know, there's always, oh, there's the, that door is locked. Oh, the, the, the highway collapsed in on itself because Silent Hill is very poorly constructed. Whatever. But you, you, you kind of are in this linear path. And there really is only one way to go, by give, but gives you the illusion of an open world. But there's very little deviation that ever really matters. Um, and the only, ex like, in Silent Hill 1, there was a little bit in that, you know, if you played that, there was that side mission where you could have gone to the hotel and got right. um, hit that guy's key and all that stuff. That was an option, but it, I kind of missed that, by the way, because the game doesn't give you any reason to ever go over there. You had to do that on your own. You had to think of it. Oh, yeah. I, um, I mean, I knew about that when I was playing it, so I did it, but yeah. yeah. If, without, like, a guide or something, I would or knowing about it from, like, the internet or however I learned about that when I was actually playing through Silent Hill 1, it was... I, yeah, I would never have done that. Precisely. And that it's same with me. Um, you know, so... But that's where Silent Hill 2, it's kind of the same idea. It's like, it's a game with no real fat, and you can beat it in a couple of hours if you really want to. Uh, but, you know, on the flip side, yeah, you've only... You bought this game, and you've only had it for a couple of hours, and now you're kind of done with it, unless you just want to replay it again. So, I guess, I, I don't know, I... I I love the idea of open world, but I agree with your basic point that open world games can make you think, like, this is more of a project than it is entertainment. Not saying it always is like that. Obviously, my favorite game of all time is an open world game, but I guess I would agree or propose, I should say, that it would be very nice if open world games gave you some options at the beginning to say like which things do you care about and which things do you not and then you can kind of choose your own adventure a little more yeah that that would definitely be a nice option for any game that could actually like fit that in i mean it, and yeah elden ring does have stuff that it could probably have a disabling toggle to but for that like the side like some of like the side small catacomb dungeons you find and stuff like that provided there's not anything in them that's like important for an important quest line or whatever mm -hmm. which you're not going to know until you do it or unless if you look it up because, but that's just general from software souls design so there yeah but and i do also want before we move on to another topic or whatever i do want to actually radiate for the people in the comments I do like Elden Ring. I like Elden Ring a lot. If I didn't like Elden Ring, I would not be having this problem. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I mean, we got it. We have to stress that the most because it sounds like we're just complaining about games having too much to do, but that's not what we're trying to say. I just hope we articulated it well enough. And if we haven't at this point, I'm not going to repeat because we've been talking about this for 25 minutes, but hopefully it came through clearly. Okay. Um, so if you're good... Hmm? Yeah, like 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 you said, hopefully it came through clearly. <laughs> Good. Um, all right. So, well, thank you for that subject. Um, and I, that was actually a fascinating conversation, honestly. Um, and let's move on to the next one, though. The next subject was picked by Chuck Shaw, another Patreon backer. He gets to pick a subject every month. Um, this one, I don't know. This is gonna. I'm gonna honestly, dude. I'm gonna lean a little bit more on you on this because I'm gonna be totally honest. This is one of those subjects where it almost doesn't apply to me. I'm going to break this down into two ways. First, there are two points. First, I needed to be very clear that I don't agree with the concept of pay-to-win games. Uh, it's, it's not something that I think you should really ever participate in. Um, I find it kind of economically dangerous for people, particularly people with addictive personalities and you know, more money than sense. Uh, and, but at the same time, it is a choice. No one is forcing you to do that. And so I play devil's advocate on that one. Um, and we can elaborate on both of those points, but the, the other point would really just be that 
I would never do this. Like, there is no pay-to-win game I would ever participate in because most pay-to-win games are online uh, relevant, and I play almost every single thing offline single-player mode games that are story-based. Again, as we were just talking about, something like uh, Far Cry or uh, Silent Hill or whatever, none of those would apply to my gaming taste so that kind of is all in the same bubble of i don't care but what i would say to those listening is what you probably already know is that pay to win games are not a very good idea for you the end user uh but i guess we should also explain what pay to win games even are i'm gonna let you take over on this though okay so when people generally are saying like pay to win games um, they're talking about games where there's like microtransactions where you basically, where, where basically in, instead of like actually earning whatever your reward you're getting in the game, you basically fork over money to the game company and then they either give you the thing or more accurately in most mo- mobile games and stuff like that, um, they'll give you they'll give you like gems that you use to roll do a roll to get that chance to get stuff. Um, but that might not necessarily be what you need, but it's like, oh, if you if you keep doing the if you keep hitting this slot machine, you might get this very strong character card, or whatever. It really depends on the game in question. It's really, it's frankly really terrible, and I hate that I've actually played a couple of them on mobile. Um, generally, for me, it, whenever I do play them, it's only for like franchises that I already like for other reasons. Like I played the Kingdom Hearts mobile games, and like a few other ones um but yeah it's i'm probably not necessarily explaining as well it's not because the way i'm saying it is not necessarily supposed to be not necessarily pay to win they're called gotcha games but the term pay to win comes around because they the developers because they want you to spend money to get the stuff basically make it very hard to actually like get anywhere in the game with just like free rolls with the free cur- with the currency you get for free just by playing the game or whatever they make it so that it feels you feel like you absolutely have to spend money to get a chance at actually getting what you want. Right, and that's yeah. Uh, it, it's kind of like almost like casino logic. Uh, you can hit the jackpot, you can win. Which, by the way, it's funny because Chuck Shaw and I have hung out in casinos together. Um, that guy makes that guy is so lucky in casinos. He was hitting jackpots all the time, making like hundred bucks here, hundred bucks there. Anyway, <laughs> um, but so yeah, I could I can understand if you were that had that kind of luck that you maybe throw down for a play to win game or pay to win game. Um, but in but for the rest of us, <laughs> I, I would seriously say that unless you for some reason are okay with this, uh, you really should never participate in a pay to win model. It's, it's, there's really nothing good that comes out of it. Like, you can understand, how do I put this, dude? I, I feel like I'm, I'm of two minds on this, because I would never do this, and I would never encourage anyone to ever do this, but if I play Complete Devil's Advocate, the only reason this is even an option is because they know there are people that will do this, and we live in a capitalist society that allows for that. And there are people that make that choice. You know, there's people that say, this is what I want to do with my money. This is what I want. This is my entertainment. Uh, and it's hard to tell an adult they're not allowed to do stuff like that. So I'm of the mindset that pay-to-win games are terrible. You should not participate in that. But that you have every right to do it. You just shouldn't. As someone who actually has spent some real world money on a couple of a few like mobile games of this type that I have played, no, I actually disagree disagree with you. They really should not exist like at all. And if the government actually decided like no, this is get this is gambling, it has to be regulated by ga- gambling. I would celebrate because there are people who have like addictive personalities and whatever whatever who can't who explicitly like try to stay away from from like gambling and stuff like that because they know they can't control themselves but all this pay to win stuff is not just staying stuck on mobile on mobile like tie-in games like the kingdom hearts mobile games Mm -hmm. or or like anime gotcha games or like genshin impact it's moving into everything including games that you pay for 
And so and publishers also, when the games are being reviewed, don't have the microtransactions for this active, so they don't even come up in reviews half the time. Okay, well, that's a separate issue, and I agree with that. If you're going to say that it pay-to-win stuff is part of the game, then you, that should be relevant to the review. Going back to the point about casinos and gambling, I do agree with gambling. I, as I said earlier, I think that's basically how it functions, is like a casino. That said, casinos are not illegal in most parts of at least the United... Well, I'm not going to say most parts. It's legal fully in three states, plus you can say all the native reservations, etc., um, point is, American citizens can get to casinos and gamble, and it's legal, uh, depending on where they are. Uh, and I feel like, you know, I'm we're not going to talk politics here, because that's not at all the nature of this. But I do feel like if you kick this up to the government trying to ban it, that creates a huge issue of my choice, my rights, this, that, and the other. Um, so I... How do I put this? I believe it should be legal just the way that casinos are legal. But if you have to have them regulated, I would actually support that as well. But what happens with a digital context like that is that it would just function out of the states that already make it legal. Like, I don't know if uh, I don't know what state you're in and you don't have to share that if you don't want to. I'm in Virginia. But, okay. Oh, I was just in West Virginia like a few days ago, dude. Oh, wow. Oh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, unrelated. Um, but anyway, so I'm guessing Virginia has, unless it has some native territories, I'm guessing it does not have legal gambling. Is that correct? Um, there was actually a proposal for Richmond to try to build a casino, so I think it might actually, it actually might. I'd have to look it up, though. Okay, so famously, it's legal in Nevada. It's famously legal in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and Illinois, my state, made it completely legal a few years ago. And then not only do you have it on native territories, but there's certain places where if you build a casino on a river or on water, then it's legal because it's not technically part of the land, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you've ever tried to gamble online for any reason, which I have not, but I have a friend who places sports bets and... If he goes out of state, like I remember once he came down, he was in New Orleans for some reason, and he wanted to place a bet on some NBA game. And he messaged me. He's like, hey, man, can you go into this website and place this bet for me? It's my account. It's all, You don't have to do anything other than place the bet. But the reason I could was because I was sitting in Illinois, and he was sitting in, um, in Louisiana, where you could not legally place the bet. The website wouldn't even be accessible. And so I think that's almost the position we would get into with pay to win yeah, games the is problem. they would only they would only work in certain parts of the country at least within the US I'm not speaking to the the majority of the world obviously in fact I think there are some countries that already decided this was not legal yeah um, I, I vague yeah, I vaguely recall the UK debating it for a while I don't really know how this all played out but yeah you're right about Belgium I do remember that um, but it would get to a point where like in the US uh, I should have also mentioned, just because they don't get enough credit, uh, gambling is also legal in other parts of the U.S., like Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, um, which is all American soil. So it would work in those places. It would theoretically, it would work in Nevada, it would work in Illinois, maybe New Jersey. New Jersey's weird because it's really only like one city that allows it. So like, does it work within that city? I don't know. You'd have to ask somebody who runs one of these gambling websites how that works. But... I feel like, okay, residents of those states could participate, um, but I don't know how it would work for everybody else. Like I said, my basic philosophy on this is this is a, a bad thing, pay-to-win games. I do not like the concept of them, but it's a logical outcome, a logical consequence of a capitalist society that prides itself on freedoms of choice. And therefore, you have the freedom of choice to do something really, really stupid to yourself. I don't. I wish people wouldn't. I agree with you that there is addicts and people who really should not be participating in this. And kids. Um, and, yes, kids is a different issue. And, yeah, if you're, and, if, and if that's this a is different one altogether. That kids, like I mentioned, yeah. Kingdom Hearts mobile games, which, by the way, have both been shut down. 
Yeah, and I agree with you on that, because if I would apply this, like you said, apply the same basic rules you have with casinos to pay to win games. And I guess I would say the, the best suggestion I would have is look at the model of how this works uh, online on sports betting websites and all that stuff where it only works in certain states and see if you can apply that to somehow function for this. Obviously, they would fight that, you know. Yeah. At the yeah. end of the day, I think that's the best solution you're going to have because having it be completely public and accessible, I don't think should be the case with minors. That's a different thing. With anybody above it, you have to argue at the end of the day, they are adults, even if it's not in their best interests. And even if you argue that some of them are not mentally stable enough to do that, it is still ultimately a choice that was made or that someone allowed, you know, them to do like, I'll, I'll tell you a little story, dude. I was in, uh, St. Louis, um, at Mo game con a few years ago. So Chuck's show. And I'm not going to say this guy's name, but there was a guy who came around, uh, and he would put down crazy amounts of money on games and when i say crazy amounts of money i'm talking numbers you and i would not fathom like he walked in there uh he was like yeah i, I bought my fifth ps5 today and he bought them off scalpers he does he's like i don't even open them i just want them uh he bought like two copies of snatcher for like 1500 bucks each at the con uh he was then having he sat down with me and we were chatting and he was talking about how he wanted to get a WADA graded Panzer Dragoon Saga. Um, and he was like, it's, you know, it's going to cost about $100,000, but I didn't want to wait for that. So I got the $30,000 copy that had a little nick in it. But as soon as I have the $100,000, i am going to spend it. And I'm like, yeah, that guy should not have access to things like that. But at no. the same time, he's an adult. Um, he was also a war vet. Like, who's going to tell a guy like that that he's not allowed to play a game? You know, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, this is this is the struggle that a... I, again, this is not a political subject, but this is a struggle that a political debate would result in, is how do you manage adults? You know? Yeah, no, I know, I know what you mean there. Yeah. Also, holy... Cr that, holy crap. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Like, and I, Yeah. I'm like... Like, I make pretty good money, and I'm like, <laughs> just hearing yeah, that. <laughs> I was, so, the, I mean, again, I don't want to reveal this guy's identity or anything. Right, no, I know he, I know, I know he watches the channel, but all I'm going to say is that um, he was, you know, at first, this conversation, when I talk to, you know, people who watch the channel, I, I'm, you know, sociable, I try to, you know, get to know him a little bit. Um, but there's always kind of this, well, are you excited? Did you find anything cool? Like persona that I kind of have, it's, it's me, I'm being myself, but it's just kind of the thing you do at a game convention. Cause that's what people are there for. I have to admit when that dude started talking about that, that was the first time anybody broke me at a convention. Like I stopped with that kind of excitement and I, I went to like a different place. I was like, dude, this is not my business, but how can you afford that? why are you doing this? And he, he, it was almost like a therapy session. Like he was openly telling me, he's like, I've got severe depression. You know, I got kind of messed up in, in the service. And he's like, I entirely live off of, you know, uh, I don't know, retirement benefits for the military, but I guess they get some sort of pension or something. And he's like, I basically just pump all that into this. And I was, you know, sitting there like, you have to stop. Like you yeah. cannot do this. Um, and I don't know if he, bettered himself i don't you know i haven't talked to him since the convention i hope he listened to some extent but yes that's not really about pay to win games no. but that's that is a perfect example of a guy who would be a victim of pay to win games when they are left completely unchecked but at the same time i don't feel comfortable telling everybody they're not allowed to have the right to do that except for people under 18 that's a different matter or right. what is legal gambling age in most of this? is it 18 or 21 do you know? I, have, I don't even know. I don't know, I but it's probably 21. Yeah, that would make sense because of the alcohol. That's usually around that. But yeah. anyway, that's, again, these two subjects that we've discussed, I feel like I haven't really come around to a solution on either one. But that that's kind of what I would say is that I agree with you that if you're going to have this, that there should be some regulations. I wish it did not exist for the same reason you wish it didn't exist. Um but we have to also look at why it exists at all. Like, 
we live in a time where video games are very expensive to produce like where one flop can theoretically just completely kill a game developer or even a major publisher if, if it's big enough like 2k barely survived the failure that was battleborn it took them years to start pumping out new content and they were mostly bailed out because their parent company was take two who was taking care of them um, and then what was the thing they did after that? It's like years later and they, they finally released like the Bioshock collection, you know, like it, it was a long yeah. road for something that they put that much capital into and flopped. But at the same time, it has become completely socially unacceptable to raise the price of games. So, I mean, for the most part, games are still 60, sometimes $70. Remember when that $70 spike on PS5 and Xbox Series X, like drove everybody insane. Yeah. Guys. They have been charging $60 since the 90s. Like, inflation is a real thing. It's affecting them. And it, it, hasn't been that long. it hasn't been that long. I, I think PS2 games were 50 I don't think they were. Yeah, Maybe some I, of them I, I, rem- I, remember, I remember a spike um, to 60 bucks with the PS3 generation. I do not, but, I, you know, I'll trust you on that. But my point is, that's still not a huge amount of money. No. And that's that's why they find every single way they can to cut things to make money elsewhere. Like, the first victim of that, of course, was, like, they stopped making manuals in games. And if they had manuals, they were gray. You know, a lot of the time, grayscale. Uh, then, of course, they push heavy on the digital stuff because there's no physical print distribution issues they mm-hmm. have to deal with. Uh, obviously, things like Game Pass distribution is even better for them. If you have some other parent company that will just dump money into it, like an Epic or a Microsoft or whatever, that's another matter. But then there's other companies where they're like, look, man, our free-to-play game doesn't make money unless we put in this microtransaction thing and we find a guy who's willing to dump 10 grand on us so he can get different colors of horse armor. You oh, know yeah, what I mean? like and, the free-to-play games. Like, yeah, a lot of these are free-to-play, but not all of... But the thing is, is that not all of them are anymore. Like, now this, mic- this loot box microtransaction stuff is in actual, like, 60 dot full price to games, too. And I agree with you. This, this all sucks... And we don't want it. I'm just explaining how we got to this point. Right. That's all that that is. For this type of thing to go away, they would have to start charging like $100 per game, which I don't think anybody would really accept because then you have to look at the idea of like, I have to pay $100 because some guy couldn't control himself and he spent ten grand on horse armors. That's Why is that my problem? You know what I mean? And that's, that's the economic trade-off, unfortunately. And so... We don't live in a perfect world, (laughs) and that means the best thing you can do, and I've been saying this for years, is vote with your wallet. You don't want pay-to-win games to exist? Don't support it. Tell people not to support that. But the reality is, if it didn't work, they wouldn't still be doing it. Right. Yeah, they. I mean, they they do it because it works. It's just, end end of the day, it makes money, they want money, so they... So they make more free-to-play games or make more pay- but games you have to pay for that have loot boxes in them. Though I think those have actually calmed down a bit in recent years because like, people were getting really annoyed with it. I know that Star Wars Battlefront 2 specifically did a lot of damage to the yeah. loot box concept. Um, you know, uh, I knew these guys who I used to see at like Ubisoft events all the time. They actually were, went out to Sweden... Uh, and they went to an EA event for Battlefront 2 well before it came out um, and to do what's what's called a mock review. I don't know if you're familiar with what a mock review is, but basically the idea is, for anybody out there who doesn't know, a mock review is when you'll uh, a company will bring in an influencer, bring them to their company and say, our project is like a year away, but we want you to play it, try it out, whatever the product is, and treat it as if it is a final product and rip it to shreds. Tell us everything that's wrong with it because we still have time to change it. Mm-hmm. That's the, the concept. So they brought these guys out to uh, uh, to Sweden and had them do that for Battlefront 2. And that was when they were the first introduced to the idea that this game was going to have loot boxes. And they, they begged them. 
to get rid of that. They were like, this is a horrible idea. You were granted, EA at the time, before you were granted like the Star Wars license before it was completely destroyed by Kathleen Kennedy. Uh, you were you were given this magical perfect entity that is guaranteed to make money. Do not do this. Like this is gonna really hurt the goodwill of the fan base and all that. And this was about the exact same time Last Jedi came out. So like you couple all that together, it was a storm. Um, so it really did a lot of damage to loot boxes in general. But obviously they didn't listen to these guys' feedback, which is right. too bad. But but at the same time, it was like okay. That's when the, I know they famously kind of got rid of the loot boxes, like with updates, didn't they? Like over over the course of time, so they eventually learned that, but they had to learn it the extremely hard way. But that said, that's EA and that's a major brand and a big release and a parent company like Disney saying you got to fix this. But anyway, I I think I unless you have anything else to say on this, I think we're done. Yeah. Anything else? I'm pretty spent on this topic. Okay. Well, Chuck, thank you very much uh, for that subject. Uh, I hope you guys got something out of that conversation. And uh, now we're going to move on. Oh, by the way, Joseph, thank you, of course, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, so, yeah, I think the last one you both were on was like when we were talking about the Batman. Yeah. That's, yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah, kind of the um, history of the it was Batman. Two, 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 month, two months ago, yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so we are back. Uh, both of you are back. And Keith, this time you we had a subject that isn't, <laughs> it's like about movies, but it's not about a specific one. So I just called this comic book movies versus their source material. And I want you to just go yeah. ahead and elaborate. Absolutely. Uh, this is a thing I've uh, been into since probably 2000 and uh, the movie X-Men came out. Uh, being a comic comic book fan all my life, and comic books being one of the reasons why I actually was able to learn to read at such a uh, tough time in my life, um, I always it's a kind of almost a pet peeve of mine of uh, comic book source material almost being like a holy grail uh, ish. Like you gotta pay some homage to the source material properly, and if you are to change it in order to change the character and what the source material is already set up. It's always been a pet peeve of mine that annoyed the hell out of me. And it's nice to get a chance to have this forum to talk about it. So what I want to do is take kind of a, a versus situation. Movies from pretty much the dawn of comic book movies coming out in the 2000s all the way up until the present. Uh, obviously not going over every single movie that came out. That would be way too many. Spider-Man is actually our first subject here. Uh, and mainly, we've got the Spider-Man movie uh, directed by Sam Raimi that came out and was a huge blockbuster hit. Versus uh, his return uh, to solo cinema in Spider-Man Homecoming. All right. So first off, uh, maybe Rob or or uh, or Adam want to talk about um, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie. Did you like it? And did you uh, what did you think about it? I mean, I think the Sam Raimi is a beautiful disaster. And as I get older, I, I kind of like you know movies that don't feel like other movies. You know, when I watch them and. I, I think that's why something like those Spider-Man movies is growing on me a little bit more. Um, and, I mean, for the most part, I think it's uh, far more comic accurate than Homecoming. Even though I think, objectively, I think Homecoming is probably a better movie. Um, um, yeah, it's Sam Raimi Spider-Man. I remember the first one coming out. I remember it being a huge deal. I remember really liking it and it blowing our minds. Except for even at the time... Tobey Maguire's, like, the CG version of him, like, running on top of buildings, even back then, looked like something the PlayStation 2 created. Um, aside from that, I thought it was a, a great movie, and I loved it, but I kept being told by people they were upset about the comic accuracies because he shouldn't have organic web growth, which they even made a reference to in the, in the latest Sp Spider-Man Far From Yeah, Home. As the comic book fan, that, has, that is one of the pet peeves a lot of people had with the Sam Raimi, uh, Tobey Maguire one, but... If, you, if Sam Raimi were to pick up a comic book at that time, or were to go into a comic book store and be like, hey, give me the latest Spider-Man uh, book. Actually, Spider-Man did have or organic web shooters at that time in the comic books, which is a very interesting thing I always thought. I almost wanted to yell that to people. I'm like, uh, guys, actually, yeah, that is what he has. It's just They just took it from what's happening in the comic books right now, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But it actually did happen in the comic books. Uh, very famously, he fought Iron Man with those web shooters and defeated Iron Man at his uh, one of his strongest ever, the extremist Iron Man. So he was actually able to defeat Iron Man using those organic web shooters. 
Um, so that's that point there, which is always interesting to make. And also, the Sam Raimi um, Spider-Man has another thing going for it when it comes to comic book is casting. Now, when it comes to casting, of course, you got... Yes, we do have J.K. Simmons, yes, in the Tom Holland universe now, kind of. But uh, that casting, when it first started, was the most perfect casting of comic book casting for a very long time. I mean, spot on. Comic book and um, screen were just mashed up there really, really closely. So I really enjoyed the heck out of that part uh, when it comes to comic book accuracy. The main issue to me when it comes to the new uh, Spider-Man is he's not much Spider-Man. The, the quips aren't enough there when he's got the suit on. The difference between having the suit on and having the suit off isn't there as much. The core character, I would say, is different. And to me, the core character of a, of a comic book movie, if you don't get the core character, I got a problem with it. I got a problem with it. You so know? I'll say that that's an interesting point, um, mm-hmm. because about particularly the end there, because one of the big things that Far From Home... Or I'm sorry, No Way Home. I keep screwing that up. Really hinges on is like Peter Parker's secret identity versus Spider-Man duality. Whereas that's like the only time that's ever mattered in the MCU ever. Um, and it's kind of hard to circle that square, as it were, because it's nobody like has ever cared about secret identities. But in that movie, it's like super important. Um, and but that was one of the big things, as you point out, about Spider-Man as a character is that he is you know, supposed to keep that very separate. And the, his big reveal, you know, like in the comics and civil war was like what ended the war kind of. Right. So it's like, I understand that that was meant to be significant, but I can, so I get why their interpretation of the character is not super useful or not accurate in the MCU. That said, as someone completely detached from comic book, shall we say nostalgia, because I'm not familiar enough with the char- that version of the character of those storylines that I could see why I'd be like, yeah, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> which it, which which is odd because uh, my one thing with the uh, Tom Hall and Spider Man's that I really praise for being comic book accurate is surprisingly Mary Jane is wonderful in the newer Spider Man. She's she's a real character. She's a real non damsel in distress real character. Uh, that is more of the attitude that we used to get from even the '60s uh, Mary Jane. Which uh, so that's another point I wanted to bring up as well. You know what? You just reminded me of a conversation I had when I was in high school. When Spider-Man 1 came out, I had this friend, shout out, who's, he's never going to listen to this, but his name was Matt. And he he was super into comics, and Spider-Man especially. And he, would, he hated that first Spider-Man movie because it lacked accuracy. And I remember having a conversation with him about it. And so, you know, he was like, I hate it because, like, he's got the organic web shooters and, you know, his, his, uh, you know, his, like, crawling thing is, like, organic instead of being built into his suit and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, wait a good. minute. What? It, it, I'm just that's just what I remember I mean, you're talking about a conversation we had like 20 years ago oh yeah gotcha. but 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 basically that he just didn't like it and I remember responding being like so are you telling me that in the comics Spider-Man is he was bit by a spider but his only connection to spiders is that he chose to build web shooters because that version of him is just like he's strong and I guess he's got you know the, the quote unquote Peter Tingle um you know this the spider sense but spiders in reality don't actually have that so they also aren't super strong so basically i liked the sam raimi interpretation because yeah. he felt like he was more of a spider you know he had he was able to crawl up the wall with just his hands instead of needing the suit which again i don't know if that's true that's what he said uh and that the organic web shooters i thought that was actually really cool i actually because it made that sense too, yeah i, I prefer yeah, that I too it's you know mm-hmm. it's it's maybe it's uh biased towards like the first one you know and that was really my i was more of a dc guy growing up but um you know so this is really my first extensive experience with spider-man where's those sam raimi movies um aside from the cartoon you know in the 90s but um uh yeah, I, I do like the, the organic web shooters better. I think it makes more sense than mm-hmm. just, like, some high school kid being able to develop, like, some some fiber that's stronger than carbon fiber and, <laughs> like, have these things and yeah. he can run out. Like, I don't know. It's like, I, I feel like it makes... I like that better. Yeah, yeah Stan, Stan Lee has actually uh, spoken about this as um, the web shooters were actually not uh, more... Uh, uh, 
an essence of his brilliance, more of a plot point. Uh, kind of a thing that he had to put in there because uh, it was a way to give uh, Spider-Man a good, kind of almost like uh, running out of ammo, as it were. Uh, a little bit more desperation, a little more drama to the, uh, some of his scenes back in the day when things were a little bit more lighter, you know? Mm-hmm. It was like some of his main dramas and his battles from uh, 60s and 70s on, uh, one, some of the main drama was because he was out of web fluid. You know, I mean, I get that. I get that from the writing perspective, but mm-hmm. I can also say that I think it works. It works better from a different context, like a film. Yeah. If you, if he doesn't need ammunition yes. cartridges and, and and how many and, just logic gaps that starts to create, as Rob pointed yeah, out. Yeah, and absolutely, I totally agree with that. Um, what I was uh, also going to say, I just remembered as you were saying, is that um, later on in the comic books, they started to have not that much issue with the web shooters to the point where like they didn't even use them anymore as a uh, catalyst for almost anything. Um, so that's why the organic web shooters kind of kind of put it in there. They kind of gave um, Peter Parker almost a second mutation. But they did the same thing with the X-Men at the time in the comic books as well, which is very interesting. Um, but uh, what I was saying, Stanley, Stanley said that they uh, eventually did not need that type of thing anymore and that the organic web shooters did work out um agreeing to your point there okay so, good know, so yeah. move on <laughs> what's the next one <laughs> really what one more i really want to talk about have you guys actually uh watched uh, the punisher movies um no the, i've seen the tom jane one a million times i okay. love it i have not seen the 80s 90s one whatever that is okay and war zone i saw once okay well, I will let you guys... I'm going to do a short uh, spiel real quick uh, because you guys don't know him very well. So the, the Punisher Warzone, to me, is the most ultimate uh, comic book to screen ever in the history of mankind. Um, it is perfect when it comes to... That's the comic book on screen live action. I've never seen a better interpretation. I have a Punisher tattoo on my arm. I've been following, following the Punisher since I could read. He's my favorite character of all time. And I just want to make this point that Punisher Warzone is exactly who Punisher is, exactly his story of origin, exactly how a Punisher comic would look on screen. No, Punisher Warzone is a horrible movie, yes. dude. Yes, okay. It now, is a horrible now, film. Now, the, you will get the the, only now, thing... you're going to get the, the film portion to me right now. Again, I'm saying this best comic book adaptation I, to a movie, I, and that's it. But yes, that's now, tell that me is why fair. it's a bad movie. Yeah, I will I trust want. you on that. This is what I want. All right, so there's only there's only a few bits of that that mm-hmm. I remember. One, I remember that uh, Wayne Knight, a, the, when Wayne Knight, who was uh, the the, the, Newman, the Newman from Seinfeld, also uh, uh, the, the the fat dude in Jurassic Park, everybody remembers him. He gets killed there. Um, he for a brief minute was super skinny, and he did a couple of movies like that was one of them, and he did Cheaper by the Dozen. He was in that, and his career nearly tanked because he was healthy. Very sad state. Anyway, so I remember him being in that movie, and he gets shot or something in the head. That that I remember. Uh, aside from that, the only thing I remember about that movie was that Tom Jane, who played the Punisher in the John Travolta movie, loved playing that character. He didn't care what anybody thought about that movie. He thought it was great. He was like, this is my favorite thing ever. He's like, and he, for years, kept his body in shape, constantly worked out. He didn't do other projects specifically because he always wanted the window open for the Punisher sequel. That's what he wanted. They eventually came to him with the script for Punisher Warzone, and he immediately said, no thanks, I'm not doing this. That's how you knew it was bad. Uh, And it was fucking terrible. (laughs) It was a terrible, terrible movie. You might be right that it's like a very accurate comic portrayal, but it is a horrible movie. I mean, one of the main points I wanted to bring up, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that kind of goes along with my philosophy in general towards... Um, comic books and comic book movies is that I think the the screenwriters and the directors and the actors love for the and passion for the source material I think trumps the accuracy towards the source material because for the most part comics are not suitable for one-to-one direct perfect remakes on the screen you know we saw that with something like uh watchmen even though i actually like watchmen um uh you know i i just they're not conducive to being able to to be a movie to the same so i i like 
Um, I like it when filmmakers and actors and writers um, love the source material and that passion for it shines through uh, in their films, not necessarily uh, through, oh, look, he's doing this exact same thing that uh, that Punisher did in issue 42, um, you know, with like, but more that they're capturing that that spirit and that passion. Um, and hence why I like Sam Raimi's, um, uh, you know, organic web shooters. Hence why, like, I don't know if this is one of the movies you chose to talk about, why I like the, uh, Zack Snyder Watchmen movie, the finale, uh, that is not a squid, just because I think it makes more sense for the movie if it's, like, more of an energy expo- explosion. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know... I, yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, but at the same time, it's like I also said, it's like I loved this most recent Batman movie because it felt like a comic book. So it's you know, dude, it's, this, I this is exactly I what completely. I was looking for. Yeah, dude, this is yeah. exactly what I was looking for, guys. This is what I was talking. Uh, the whole point of this entire thing was to let everyone know that perfect comic book accuracy does not mean best movie. I actually like The Punisher with Thomas Jane in it much better as a Punisher fan than Punisher Max. Though I believe Punisher Max is the best adaptation of Punisher on the film, I do enjoy the Punisher movie with Thomas Jane. You mean Warzone? Punisher, sorry, Punisher Warzone because, sorry, Punisher Warzone is based on the Punisher Max comic books, I apologize. It's all good. Yeah, it's it's um, kind of like because most of this audience is video game based. Let me give a, another comparison here. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of you out there have played Resident Evil, yeah. and you've probably seen the Resident Evil movies, and they have almost nothing to do with each other except for loose narrative. Imagine a literal interpretation of the gameplay of Resident Evil into a film. Imagine a character just walking around a mansion trying to find a jewel so they can unlock the clock handle that would give them the key to unlock the door that unlocks the other door. Like, that would be a horrible movie. Yeah. And so, source material is good for bits and pieces of inspiration, but keeping it perfectly accurate, not an interesting yeah. experience. Have you guys seen all the X-Men movies? Yes. I would say with the X Men franchise overall, like I'm glad Disney's gonna get rid of it <laughs> canonically because yeah. like it'll exist in its own universe of events. But I mean, mm-hmm. it was a cluster, um, and it it was like I love parts of it, but for every movie in there that's really good, you have like for every Days of Future Past, there is a Wolverine. You know, there like the, well, the terrible one. Yeah, the uh, Wolverine Origins, right? Yeah, the Origins Wolverine yeah. movie that was like one of the worst things ever. Um, you know, for every X2, there's an X3. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just... It was rough. It, it, it's the hit and miss franchise in the world. But uh, I'll tell you one thing. That's what started it off is the, uh, for me, is the comp- when it comes to comic book movies, is X-Men. And that first shot when they were showing that uh, concentration camp was, was quite powerful that Brian Singer put in there. So I that mean, was interesting. To be fair, yeah. I mean, X-Men, that first X-Men film in 99 is what set the ball rolling on mm-hmm. everything uh, as far as like our modern comic book movies like consumption. Like Prior to that, the only one that was ever taken too seriously was either like Batman, who almost killed himself as, with Batman and Robin and Batman Forever, and Superman like two decades yeah. earlier. So that was really all you got that anybody cared about because the odd ones out would be like things like The Phantom or that like really crappy Captain mm-hmm. America movie yeah. or Supergirl or ones that just didn't work. But X Men really made everybody think like, huh, you don't have to literally be Batman or Superman to have a movie. Exactly. And a, another bad representation of a good comic book movie is um, technically Daredevil with Ben Affleck is good to the comic books, but it's a horrible movie. You know? Absolutely atrocious. So yeah. it's, just, it's just an awful, awful movie. But comic book wise, everything's de- pretty much dead on. You're like, oh, sh- I-, I don't like how accurate this is. They're getting giving me the accuracy I wanted, but they're not giving me the other stuff. And X Men, that's when accuracy doesn't matter because X Men makes fun of the fact that it's not accurate. I mean, there's one point where they are sitting in the uh, Blackbird jet, and uh, Wolverine's complaining on how tight the uniform is, and and Cyclops says, uh, "What were you expecting? Yellow spandex." So, mm-hmm. you know, actually, you know, Did you ever see the yeah. I, I, I te- technically X-Men three is more accurate to Internet meme culture because it includes the juggernaut bitch. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's actually more accurate to that. They met, they actually sc- <laughs> they screwed up the juggernaut uh, just so they could put up that line. Let's <laughs> let, let's have Kitty. Pr- let's have some for some reason juggernaut be a mutant ma- magically in this one. All right. Uh, the X-Men three is probably one of the examples of the worst 
uh, just screwing up comic books, uh, characters. Oh, man, it got really bad. X3 got really bad, sorry. Ugh, I don't know what to think about that. But uh, X-Men in general, the very first one, and especially X2, when they really hit their stride, and it was a really, really great movie. Um, and th making their own universe out of the characters was just better because there's so much more comic book in, in X3, and yet X2 is the best. It's, again, coming around to the overall point, just another great example of how if you have the comic book movie perfect to the comic books, doesn't always make it a good movie. You know? I would actually Love say, that. based on all the examples that we've cited so far, that if you are true to the comic book, your movie sucks. Exactly. I mean, I'm just saying, yeah, exactly. Comic books are not movies. Movies are not comic books. Their narratives are not interchangeable, just mm -hmm. like I said with video games. Yep. Almost, I think this I need why to you famously... Yeah. Famously, you never have good video game movies. Oh, yeah. Uh, and why very often you rarely have a like a movie that they make into a game where that's good. There's very few exceptions. All right, next up, the <laughs> speaking of Man of Steel, yes, Superman. The the man himself, the, the quintessential superhero, the guy who started the icon of superhero. How a superhero is supposed to look and act and whatnot and have that square jaw, you know? We've got Superman... All the way back, Christopher Reeves, super actually, sorry, um, uh, George, yeah, George, Reeves, George yeah. uh, I know, it's a Reeve thing that messes with my brain. George Reeves, George Reeves out, and Christopher Reeve, no and relation. Chris, and then Christopher Reeve, um, also the tragedies, no relation as well. Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> and then all the way up until, um, oh shoot. What's next? Yeah, Dean Cain. You have yeah, yeah, Dean Cain. Uh, Brandon Routh. I was thinking uh, like Henry Cavill. Yeah, Brandon Brandon Routh would be the next one up with Tom movies. Welling. And then um, after that would be um, Henry Cavill for the movies. Yeah, you, you also if you have TV, you also have Tom Welling. You have whoever played Superboy. I said Dean Cain. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Shout out to Tim uh, Tim Conroy. I think who voiced him on uh, the animated series and still kind of does from time to time. Yeah, he is all, uh, always my pick when it comes to Superman. Or Tim Daly, Tim Daly, sorry. Tim Daly, yeah. Tim Daly, yeah. Which uh, I was combining Kevin Conroy with Tim Daly. Dude, when he when he just does a uh, 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 just a sentence about how much uh, Superman loves a milkshake in the animated series, it's it's just hilarious. He, Tim Daly mm -hmm. does such a great job. But um, we're gonna talk about the movies here. So the uh, you know the old CRISPR, uh, the old uh, you guys seen George Reeves Superman a lot? Did you guys see the old classic I have. heroes? I have. Thank you. I yes, have. me I too. Have, yeah. So, what do you guys think about that in relation to Superman? Now, those are pretty spot on to the comic books. Really kind of similar, except for, except for they didn't really go into any science fiction aspects, really, in the comic books. Well, both of them stem from a very different era, where, I mean, super the, that TV show in particular, it lacked budget and technology to do anything. So, a lot of it was just left to your imagination. Um, in, for example, in that show, there's only one shot ever of George Reeves on a wire set flying. One. And the reason is they filmed one, and when they tried filming a second, the wire collapsed, and he refused to ever do it again. So that same shot was recycled over and over and over, which is why every time he land, they'll use that one shot, and then he'll just like jump through a, a window, and that's how they connect it. So you never see him fly. Now, that is, ironically, somewhat accurate, because in the comics originally, as I understand it, he did not fly. He just jumped buildings in a single bound. That's why that yeah. whole it was, thing it, comes. It was an extension of that power is what it was. He can kind of keep going and use his momentum. For a little almost, bit like, almost like the Hulk, but a little bit tall, but right. a little bit farther. So, yeah, the, when Superman was created, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, uh, uh, basically, uh, they thought of the idea of a, of a Superman, a strong man, being like what you would think of a, the strong man in the circus being... Like, the guy who can, like, I can lift this whole weight with just one arm. You know, like, that kind of show of that era. And so they just took that to the next level, which is why he wears tights, because he's supposed to look like a circus performer that could have jumped a building in a single bound. You know, like, that's what the origin is. But eventually, when they went to TV, of course, you know, and they were updating things as they went, you know, especially World War II changed a lot of his comics because there would be entire episodes where he'd go and defeat the, you know, the Nazis by himself. Um, but, you know, stuff like that, that just kept increasing his power level. Uh, and this is this is one I actually do know because I know over time Superman comics got insane. Like, you know, he, he got to a point where he was so powerful he could, like, 
blow air at a at a star and the star would extinguish like and they're like what do you even write anymore (laughs) as a controversy he could blow out he could blow out the sun like it as it were a candle on a cake precisely (laughs) and you know but i basically what i'm saying is most comic books i think of superman are terrible um because they are not a very good representation of what we would probably think of as the character uh, but that said, the, unfortunately, the same applies to the movies. Most of the movies do a very poor job of saying who the character is. Where the character shines, in my opinion, has been and probably always will be television. Mm-hmm. Uh, because TV has enough time to explain everything about the character. He's much more complex than strong guy who is an alien. Great. It's way more fascinating. Um, but in the comics, they don't want to spend a whole lot of time dealing with that. And, of course, they inevitably get into quirky weirdness. Uh, the movies don't have a whole lot of time to focus on that either. So they just try to tell, like, a one-punch story. Uh, and, but then eventually they do something stupid like Superman 3 and 4 and so on and so forth. Um, and so, but, you know, like Smallville, for example, probably the greatest interpretation of the character's origins uh, and really flushing him out. Maybe it went on too long, but yeah. and apparently, like the new Superman show, which I have not seen yet, people say that might be the best Superman thing ever created. Huh? But I haven't watched it. But it's just for the same reason, which is you give them enough t- time for this character to flush out, and you realize he is more dramatic and more interesting than strong guy who stops bank robbers, which is a very stupid, childish interpretation of what the character is. Um, and like the, the, we just mentioned it uh, with uh, Tim Daly there, the animated series also does an incredible job of exploring like how rich Superman's villains are and how, what it's like for him to fight them and what it is for him to deal with the humanity of trying to be a human while not being one, living with the drama of losing his entire civilization, etc. That's all pretty complex stuff. Yeah. And I, I never like it when people just interpret superman as he's a strong guy and oh. that makes him boring and that makes him boring fuck you you don't understand shit yeah do you know who he lives i mean in the fortress of solitude he keeps species that are also the last of the kind so they don't have to be alone man that that's yeah, deep it, man yeah there's the, superman is a much richer character in in character Agreed. than people tend to give him credit for but I will admit that the only place they would ever know that is if they watch the TV yeah. shows. The movies and the comics have done terrible jobs of portraying that. So, do you think it is impossible then to actually get a good Superman movie per se to to, to the point where no, it would be as good? I do not. I believe it could be done. Mm-hmm. Um, I, but I believe that the model that would have made that work, they already screwed up, which was the basically the cinematic universe model. Mm. They tried it with the DCU. But they, as I just said, they jumped that too quickly when they did um, Batman v Superman as the second film. Yeah. Like, Man, Man of Steel was not perfect, but at least it kind of showed that they were like, Look, he's not just a strong alien dude. There's, like, a lot of drama in this dude's background. Um, And there's a lot of issues there that need to be resolved. And he's got to fit in. And there's a lot to it. It's not a perfect film. But building off of that would have worked. That said, if you wanted to completely, you know, scorch the earth and try it again, you could do that. But you're going to have to tell his origin again. Which is unfortunate because everybody knows his origin. And that's, I don't know how you get away with it. I mean, yeah, yeah, that is definitely a tough one. But it's good to know that uh, there's some hope out there. There's some hope. (laughs) I believe, well, we'll see. Uh, You know, this is kind of unrelated, but not. Warner Brothers and, you know, just did another corporate change. AT&T is not there. And their new head uh, is like, okay, Superman is now our priority. So that we'll probably start seeing a lot more Superman content Mm -hmm. soon. Yeah, we're we're DC... uh and stuff is actually still excelling at the moment is actually in a TV show called Young Justice, by the way. If you guys ever seen that one. It's probably yeah, one of that one. That, that is yeah, exactly. amazing. Well, that's what I'm talking Again, about. Again, more that. TV shows, yeah. Was, yeah, there's that Arrowverse stuff, right? Yeah. Um, everybody's telling me that the Superman show that's in there is incredible. And I know it had a Smallville crossover at one point and a Brandon Routh slash Christopher Reeve crossover, which was pretty cool. Um, 
I don't know if you knew about that. Did you know about that? Yeah. The crossover crisis. They, that, that was really yeah. Good. It was really interesting, but I was not. I was actually upset. It's like, cri- was a crisis on infinite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they 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 yeah. actually. Yeah, I mean, they brought in Kevin Conroy to do a live action. Yeah, Bruce Batman. Wayne, live action yeah, Bruce Wayne. Which is, yeah, yeah, that yeah. thing was pretty cool. I think we talked about it yeah. back in the day. Um, but, yeah, but anyway, yeah. so obviously I have a bit of an axe to grind when it comes to Superman comics versus movies versus TV. But <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I honestly do not believe they've gotten really even close to accurate with any Superman actual movie. There's Superman movies I enjoy. I enjoy actually just the Richard Donner cut mainly of Superman 2. And I, I, I do enjoy the homage to the classic Superman that Brian Singer gives us. And I do think that if Brian Singer had Brian Singer's universe continued, it would have been much interesting. Yeah, so uh, Keith, thank you very much Absolutely. for the subject and for joining us as always. I want to give shout outs to uh, Chuck Shaw. Obviously, Joseph for joining us earlier. Uh, Abdullah, of course, for joining us before that. Uh, Spencer Perrier, as well as Luis Bonilla, Loke, Michael Kelly, Paul Lewis, Tim Inman, and Trey Wagner. Thank you to all of them. Rob, thank you, too. Uh, and uh, You're very welcome, Adam. Yeah. As always, please like, comment, subscribe below. Uh, hit up the social media stuff in the, scri- in the description. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, Patreon, etc. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you all later. Bye.